heard during the um, presentation in the budget, the, the issue of um, providing um, additional support under the public assistance program. We would be rolling out um, additional support for the CDB and World Bank support, where persons who have been on the waiting list for public assistance will be getting. Um, this income support um, is critical at this time because we are increasing you know, both horizontally and vertically the support that's been given to, to persons. So we will increase it slightly, the amount, but we also will also be adding more persons to, would be receiving income support at this time. So I'm very pleased to report to St. Lucians that that is, that is critical. Um, also persons, if, persons living with HIV also will be receiving support under the income support, um, as well as um, how the, the number of persons who are who are receiving the disability grant. They would also, we will also be increasing slightly as well as increasing the amount that they, they will be receiving. Hi, um, two questions from me. The first one um, on the income support. I saw, I saw a notice from your ministry about um, some support that you guys are offering to persons who lost their income due to COVID or to children who lost their parents due to COVID that have not gotten anything. But <clears throat> how does this benefit small business owners who lost their businesses through COVID um, and did not, like if somebody was a, 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 small, a small business, a micro business, one person operation and because of COVID they lost their, their, their income. The provisions that you've given doesn't allow for these people to benefit. So how, how do these people get okay. support? Um, the, 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 any safety net program is limited. It cannot take care of everything first. So it is not um, the amount of resources to, to touch everybody. So we're looking at the persons who are most vulnerable in that regard. And we would use our SL net 3.0, which is a, a poverty tool that targets the most vulnerable. It's scientific. And the persons who are on public assistance and persons that we are seeking to serve, because we are the Ministry of Equity, Social Justice and Empowerment, we are targeting the most vulnerable. Um, understand that the ministry, um, social intervention is not only by the Ministry of Equity. So for example, you would, you would have heard the Ministry of Commerce, for example, implementing small business loans and of course would, would provide an opportunity for individuals as well. The Bell Fund for its support provides for vulnerable persons up to, 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 to some extent. But the Ministry of Equity through that program is you know, specifically targeting, um, I would say, persons in the last quintile of our population, extremely poor people. That is our mandate. That's what the ministry is doing. So when, when you, we speak of our interventions, we, and we, we speak of persons who are very, very vulnerable. And sometimes, um, until you could put an eye to those individuals, if you've not experienced it, you wouldn't even know what, what I'm talking about. So it's, it's, it's difficult sometimes to speak as a, as a ministry because of the people that we represent. You know, and um, it's not obvious when some of us live a particular life and we, we're not exposed to persons who probably do not have the means of disposing their waste they do not have a house with a floor. You know, I personally have seen children living on, on, on the ground. That's what their floor is with a mattress. I've seen this and I've had to address it even within the year uh, as soon as we came into elections. And there are people living um, below the poverty line. What they consume is far less. So there are questions that would be applicable to the Ministry of Commerce in terms of small business and persons who would have, you know, suffered the loss of business through COVID. But there are other persons who fall within our micro, you know, interventions dealing with 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 with, with um, a certain level of vulnerability, and it's only captured for a scientific tool, which is the SLNet 3.0. Okay. Um, second question. There was a murder mm -hmm. in your constituency on Saturday. Mm -hmm. um, what, what do you have to say and what are you planning to put into put in place in your constituencies, but um, specifically to ensure that Yes, I, I, I cannot guarantee that the interventions we have in will, will prevent murders. Um, for as 
for as I've, I've known for, for a very long time that even when the earth was most perfect, Cain killed Abel. And, um, and I understood their parents were, were good parents. Um, the, the, what I, one of the things that I'm, I'm trying to encourage in Castries South is, is the issue of uniting our communities and uniting people. We need to be together. We should not allow religion and other forms of, of, of partisanship, politics, to divide the communities and people in the communities the way it has happened. It has affected families. So I would be, through the work of under this constituency development program, I would be advocating for a lot of values program to children. Um, and I'm hoping that it will catch up and get mainstream, you know, where we need to focus on impacting values to our younger generation, respect, tolerance, love, saying thank you. You know, those courtesies, we had them before and we took them for granted. But we've lost so much in a short space of time in exchange for what? Maybe the extra dollar, what have you. I think if we spend time in the social reengineering of the next generation, I think we would gain a lot more. Um, at a, at a, in the meantime, we continue to invest in our young people. Um, I'm happy that we had, for example, the CPA pageantry, the confidence of our young people in Castries office. I enjoy this. Um, sports, I, um, the, we, we continue to see investment in sports and, and be inspired like, um, like Julian Alfred um, will impact our wider population when she goes out there and performing the way that she did. All of these interventions, together with what the ministry is doing with the social transformation officers on the ground, will contribute, but it will not by itself, you know, prevent crime. You also, as young persons, you need to add your voice, because the responsibility of having a, a solid society is not just government, but it's every one of us. So that is... That is um, that is my answer to this. All right, I think we have a yeah. yeah. Um, my question is about accessibility. Um, I know. Is there are there any plans in your ministry to improve um, the accessibility to, like, let's say, facilities for people with disabilities? Because I know in Saint Lucia we don't we don't really have like ramps or these type of things um, to access, you know, certain buildings, certain places of work. So, are there any plans um, to improve those? Okay. Um, yes. So the Ministry of Equity will will continue to be an advocate because the, the physical planning department is the one responsible, the Ministry of Infrastructure is responsible for our infrastructure. What my ministry will continue to do is to advocate. So we are not the one designing buildings. However, um, with the, the, the nature of our, our um, infrastructure, it doesn't cater for persons with disabilities. It's far from being what it's supposed to be. But, however, it's, I am of the opinion that we need to coexist and find ways of, of being able to facilitate persons with disability. Um, so, for example, if um, somebody who is um, with a disability um, is using the elevator in the building, we should not deny the person work because the person cannot reach the keys in the elevator somebody must be downstairs to receive our influence, and that must become the normal part of our practice. Mm -hmm. So where um, the technology doesn't allow for us to, to, to do what is happening in first world country, our humanity must step in. So therefore, I do not see um, difficulties with, in accommodating persons with disabilities currently. We need to, if we believe in, in we being um, they are, they are differently able, and we also recognize their rights, and um, then we would, accom we would accommodate them. I know of a story of a young lady who went to Safa Lewis, and she's really short, and, um, and the furniture, the students, she said her two years at Safa Lewis was facilitated by her students, not even the school, and successfully completed Safa Lewis, you know, being that, that, that short. So our humanity um, makes a difference when technology is not available. But the ministry responsible for, for fixing our infrastructure with, with the rumps and sidewalks and, 
and and um, and get all this the necessary technologies with with um, the, the for persons with disability to be able to utilize the Ministry of Physical Planning in how they what what plans and what buildings they approve and the Ministry of Infrastructure and design of the roads and infrastructure. Okay, so two questions. Uh, you mentioned bridging the gaps in, in, in communities. So my first question to you is, uh, as, the, as the rep, what are you doing to ensure that the youth are being brought together in terms of, let's say, sporting activities or after-school programs? That's you as the rep. Now the second question is now you as the minister with the Boys Training Center, what is being done to ensure that the young men are put into programs that could help them be constructive? Yes, thank you. Thank you so much for this question. And um, as the parliamentary representative, the going and do things for, for, for communities has its benefits, but also has it, it's, it, it you know, it's, uh, there's a negative to it. As against facilitating communities doing things for themselves, that when you're no longer the power rep, it continues. What I have, what I'm trying to get um, communities to organize themselves and, em and try to empower them that they can do for themselves. And um, up to yesterday, I had a meeting with the um, cricketers, the, 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 the young men, the people who play cricket. Um, street cricket in, in Macronland. It's a very interesting sport. I, I enjoy watching the rules as to so how you could be fielding on the, uh, under the bush and nobody know that you're there, but you have to be, be there for when the ball gets there to send it back on the road. Very interesting. But like I said to them last night, I would like for when I'm no longer the parliamentarian that it continues. So you must organize yourself and take responsibility for, for doing it. I'll facilitate it. Um, the, there is um, a, a cricket activity in forest here every Easter. I, it is really forest here activity. It should not take a parliamentarian to cause this to happen every Good Friday or every time. The community should be is so resourced and also has the capacity to be able to do that on their own. Just like we have the Lawas and La Margaret, it doesn't require a politician for Lawas and La Margaret to take place. So the, what I'm trying to do as the parliamentarian is to empower, facilitate, but ensure whatever I do that is sustainable, that it is not just the, um, the, 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 the parliamentarian there. So you would not hear, in, for example, a Joachim Henry football competition. You know, I've said, I've said to them, name it after Lumpus, or a name that would remain, not Joachim Henry was passing through. You know, so the, the football competition, when I'm not there, it's still going on. So our people must think of their communities, again, unite and come together because they are resources. But if people are divided through religion or through partisan politics, you find the communities are weak. The resources are there, but they are weak. You know, so I heard, for example, um, the former power rep asking me to cut the grass on a forest here, playing field, you know, during the last... It's the community with more backhoes and excavators than you could get anywhere else in the world. With the wealthiest of contractors, what have you, you would wonder why is there a playing field in forestry and then the, the community has not owned it to protect it and secure it. You know, there are poor communities who have been able to do that. So in Castro South East, that's my agenda. That's my focus. It's difficult to do because a lot of persons have gotten, gotten into the habit that the power rep must come and do for them, you know, um, everything. We also, I'm trying to launch what I consider to be a debating competition within the constituency. Um, again, among the young people. I think debating the issues among young people will help, you know, bring about, a, a, you know, consciousness as to where we are. So the issue of intergenerational poverty, that needs to be discussed by the young people because you are the ones that are going to inherit a future and you need to, dis you need to understand decisions are made today. How do you fit into, into this place tomorrow? What is going to be like to you? The issue of um, reproductive, sexual um, reproductive health and rights of, 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 is something that's supposed to be discussed and, de and, and debated among young people. There are a number of thematic areas that if you do not discuss it at the community level, it will not empower people. 
it should not be political talking points. So the level of advocacy among young people needs to be encouraged and people need to empower and do things for themselves. That is, that is how you're going to have the real social transformation and re-engineering of our population. Okay, so last question for me. Yes, final question from me. <clears throat> do you think, with your background with the SSDF, do you think that, um, well, I'm sure you've noticed that there is a direct correlation between um, job opportunities or people being in jobs and the level of crime. Um, is that something that you're going to look at in your constituency? Because um, in Otsa, for example, in the industrial area there, there were a number of um, factories where a, a vast number of the, pop of the population of that constituency um, were employed. And that number has dwindled to almost nothing now. Um, in fact, I would be surprised if even one of those factories are still open. Is there any plans for you to go into bringing back those factories, maybe encouraging some of those companies to come back and to encourage employment for the people as a means of reducing the level of crime in the constituency? I, I, have, I haven't seen research that, that suggests that there's a strong correlation between crime um, you, crime among young people and unemployment. However, we believe that if persons are, young persons are unemployed, one, the right to digni you know, is part of the dignified work. Um, um, you, you earning a living is a right persons must have to. But you still find in some jurisdiction where people who are gainfully employed also participate in crime. Um, but yes, we will. The Ministry of Commerce and I'll support the, the the minister responsible for investment, every opportunity because the lands in Kalisak in Odsa belongs to it. It's under the auspices of the of Invest and Ministry of Commerce. So those these areas of intervention are really the, the, the responsibility of certain ministry. And yes, I would continue to advocate. But what I can do and what I'm trying to do, for example, we have the ground floor of a community centre built in Odsa. I've decided to use my CDP and support of the Taiwanese and convert it into small cottage businesses to put um, a barber salon, a hairdresser, I'll convert it downstairs of the community center and allow the young people to, to get it at peppercorn rate or, or, or give them one year lease without paying rent and to operate the barber salon. I'll do that in all other vacant public spaces within the community so it provides opportunity and I'll buy the equipment and put in it. You know, um, I've also asked a, a barber to train two young men in Kalisak who's willing to become barbers. And so at the level of a community, I am doing this to inspire people that there are low hanging fruits, there are, there are interventions at the community level. If you want to be gainfully employed, if you prepare to put your mind at it, you will gain support. Also part of my CDP, a lot of what I've received as, as constituency development support through the Prime Minister have invested directly in small businesses or persons who want to open a business, whether give them a small grant to stock up their shop and whatever you have done this. And I continue to do it. So employment, um, it's, it's about livelihoods, how persons are able to, to, to embark on their livelihoods. And that I am trying to do. And, but of course, I recognize that the ministry responsible for investment also have a significant role Final to play. Question. He asked me a question with regards to the boys' training center, and um, the the um, as a ministry, we we have a plan for the boys' training center. We continue to work um, with we, cabinet approved for us to set up a, a steering committee with a number of stakeholders that will guide that process because it is not just what I personally believe, but we want to subject this thing to to a wide cross section of other stakeholders. But the, the ideal thing, what will guide the way forward is one, that we are rationalizing all of these juvenile centers. Um, you have the, the, the uptowns place where you have the young girls, you have the transit home in Kazaba, you have the boys training center. So we need to discuss that and rationalize that. We, one of the things that I personally have a, a difficulty with as a, as a minister is that you cannot have five girls, but you have an assist, a manager and assistant manager at, at the uptown girls and have six over there, you have an assistant manager. So between the three centers, juvenile centers, you have six managers, yet we still have problems. The cost of operating is too high. So we need to rationalize that, you know, and, um, and we are moving to, 
George Charles um, Secondary School to be, let it become our premier juvenile center. But while we're doing this, we have to think of a juvenile detention center because what is going on at the boys training center, we have young men who are there for care and protection and we have young men who have issues with the law and they're too young to go to bodyless. So we do not have a detention center for juveniles. We, the boys training center was really a place for care and protection, not for persons who are in, who are in conflict with the law. So the, the prison um, or, the, or, the, or the courts have been transferring young men who are in, have serious issues with the law but do not have an age based on our child protection laws cannot go to prison because they, the young people have a right. So in the redesigning of a, of a, of a juvenile center, we will take all of that into consideration and with the necessary consultation with all of the stakeholders, it will be decided where best to be placed. Um, whether it be placed on the site, whether it be elsewhere, what the design is supposed to be and everything like that. So we are working on this. Um, with Back to the COVID-19 income support uh, that was the information released from the Ministry of Equity. It was a bit of a surprise or rather out of the blue. Can you provide some more insight or some background information on on that? Yeah, that the income support on the COVID, um, the theme COVID started um, since COVID time, but all of it was not implemented then. And the um, funders came back and said, we are prepared to give you additional funds under the same regime. So yes, the, the, the term COVID may have signaled COVID support, um, but it's really a, um, to enhance our safety net for um, persons, the fallouts you have as a result of COVID. And of course, the lingering problems with COVID is that you still have persons who have not returned to work. You have persons, um, I was aware based, um, in a presentation where some jobs actually disappeared because of COVID, um, what transpired. So the fallout is significant and the resources actually, the, 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 the um, Caribbean Development Bank um, is continued to provide support under the same regime, the COVID response to our vulnerable population. Okay, I think that's and, Thank you. and just one point I need to make, um, sorry about this, of course you would have noticed I have a statement was made on social media on my private um, Facebook with regards to um, the rights of, of, of newborn babies. It's a matter that um, these matters, in t when babies are born at the hospital, they should not be denied their birth documents because mommy owes. I think the child is a citizen and has rights and needs to be processed in terms of getting registered and what have you. And if, so I, I spoke on this. It's a matter that I've raised among my colleagues as well as persons who have died and there's um, money's owed to them. They owe money, sorry, owe, they owe money to the hospital and they're they are not able to bury their loved one because of an outstanding. I did advocate that these areas are areas that we continue to, to, um, to work with. But I am the chief advocate for vulnerable population as minister responsible for vulnerable people and what affects poor people. Um, I will always continue to air and to stir discussion even within the population on the areas that affect our poor, vulnerable population. Um, but of course, the Minister of Health um, champions this. In fact, he was surprised that some people, some technical people, um, still um, do not allow persons to get those certificates for one reason or the other. And it reminds me of our, our attempt to reduce the cost of um, sanitary products. And, and while we reduce by removing VAT, the private sector did otherwise, and now we now we need to respond and put these things on as price control. So we, as a government, we know that they are technocrats, and um, while when we establish policies one way or the other, whether we, by speaking to 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 to, peop, to persons who are responsible, sometimes other persons for for <coughs> other reasons do otherwise, and. Um, but we need to continue to speak out, and in that case, I just air my views as the minister or the chief advocate late, on this. Yeah, um, Mr. Minister, um, lately, you've, you've, you know, the government has been rolling out se several social programs. The last, the last one, the last edition was to um, to enhance to help people who were displaced during the COVID. 
would that entail um, small vendors, like small caterers, you know, there are some people who uh, did little catering at their home, small vendors, you know, would that, what, what, what range of people would it, would it really entail that could? The, like I said, I answered the question earlier on, it's, it's targeted. And um, we, it's not for every, we cannot do everybody, but we're looking at, we apply, we apply a tool, a, 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 a tool, a proxy means this, or a proxy, um, or, or, or what you call SLNet 3.0, a measurement tool, so that we can target persons who need things most. There's a multidimensional aspect to poverty. It's not just about absence of income. But when you, when you apply, when you, when you view um, poverty from a multidimensional lens, you see other deprivation. So the person might be without income, but the person also might be suffering from cancer, what have you. That is taken into, into consideration when you're looking at vulnerability. The person may, may, have, um, may have the issue of um, dealing with, with, with illness as well as income, but may also go through you know, some other part of their life where someone has passed. Or, so we, we take all of these into consideration when we are um, applying support to individuals. And when, shocks, when people experience shocks in their lives, it's a lot more complicated. So the multidimensional aspect of poverty is what our SL, SL 3.0 actually consider, not just the fact that you've lost a job, because there are persons, even while they've lost the job, may be worse off than, than others. And the money is going to take care of everybody. OK, so recently we've seen that the horse race track in Viewford is starting some development on it again, um, seeing all according to an article that was published. Um, so seeing all the controversy in the past, um, does the government have a hand to playing it and what do you have to say on it? Well, I'm not aware that any developments are taking place with the T.O. Akin, DSH, Alan Chastney, horse racing track. I'm not aware of that. I've seen no photos being informed of any developments in that regard. I'm aware, though, that Viewfort, the people of Viewfort, are planning to, the certain interest in view for that planning to have a traditional horse race. They've had that for many years before DSH came, before Tioakin came, they've been having their horse races in view for it. In fact, I will tell you, if you recall, the last time the leader of the opposition went to view for it together with the leader of the opposition from Belize, there was a clip of some young men accusing him of coming and killing their horse racing in view for it to bring Tioakin and that he's partly responsible for a lot of what was going on, if you recall that. So it shows that the horse racing in Viewfort had been a traditional activity, and I think what you're seeing was a, an attempt to revive that. And of course, I think one of the local contractors was assisting them in making the arrangements so they can revive their traditional um, local horse races in Viewfort. The government of St. Lucia is not involved. It is not a government activity. And in fact, I applaud um, the young people of Viewfort if they believe um, the traditional activity was taken away from them and they want to bring it back and meaningfully and productively engage themselves in such an activity. I think it's a good, a good one. I noticed the narrative going around that as, as if this government now is putting horses before hospital. Now, I mean, this is absolutely um, laughable because um, a community deciding to revive the horse racing, which was destroyed by the last government, um, is not the same. And, and secondly, the government is not involved in it. And thirdly, I don't know you can equate it. I mean, a lot has been done now um, to you know, resolve the hospital issue in Viewfort. And in fact, there's criticism that the government is doing too much uh, to complete the hospital and uh, you know, a lot of you know, um, feedback. I would believe that everybody in St. Lucia would, certainly both parties, would say, once and for all, let's get it right and complete this project. And I think you know, we just have to put this whole thing in context. This horse racing has nothing to do with the government or any attempt to put you know, horses before hospital. We are finishing the hospital and we will finish the hospital. Yeah, yeah. With the SAG after strikes um, in the United States, um, I was just wondering 
is there anything that the government is doing or your ministry in particular uh, is doing to protect the rights of creatives in Tenusha, um, in terms of intellectual property and that type of thing um, so that you know exploitation doesn't happen well there, there, there is law in St. Lucia that you know provides for intellectual property rights um, different countries have their own regime on, of legislation according to how mature and developed their creative industry is ours is a very very infantile industry we are just starting to create an excitement a vibe about creative industries and of course as it matures um, a lot more policy and regulation will come into play. Echo is there as it relates to um, you know, some aspect of the creatives. But I mean, as, as the industry matures, um, you will see a lot of the public demand, well, both from the public and from creatives, to have regulation and protection of them. So we're still very early days. I mean, we, we had a very early stages of creating a creative industry and creating a vibe and awareness and a necessity for us to have um, a creative economy in St. Lucia. One, um, <clears throat> I noticed that you saw that you on your last visit um, during the um, annual conference of um, tourism tourism advisors or travel advisors in Turks and Caicos that you took some time out to meet with St. Lucian's working overseas. Um, what was that like? What, what was it like to meet people, you know, our fellow countrymen, and yeah. how are they doing over there? And stuff yeah, like that? Um, I think, you know, for me, it was really inspiring to, to, to meet them. Um, I hosted a breakfast for some of them, and then they invited me to go out on their, um, we, they don't have a grocery Friday night, it's a Thursday night you know, fish fry, where well, it's more lobby, because you know, lobby is a big thing in Turks and Caicos. Um, it was really good meeting them and the stories, they came over, some of them have left the hotel and brought them over, the beaches, um, and they have their own independent lives now, and they sat in their own families, and there's quite a significant St. Lucia population, and to hear of the activities of the association, it was really pleasant. I, I didn't know they were so active. Um, so it was really good. And and what also made it, you know, quite pleasing to me, um, you, you, you spent many years growing up in St. Lucia and you hear all the talk, you know, Sandals bringing on a lot of foreigners who work in St. Lucia and, you know, Lucians are getting opportunities, whatnot. And since I became minister, you know, I actually, you know, challenged Sandals and that. And said the popular perception in St. Lucia is that foreigners coming to work here and Lucians are getting no jobs. And they told me, no, 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 no. They'll give me the facts. And almost a hundred St. Lucians are out working in various handles properties around the region. After Jamaica, we have the most St. Lucians now. And as I said in my posting on that, supposedly those St. Lucians are taking the jobs of other people. You know, because when people come here, we do say, you know, they're taking St. Lucian jobs. And to some extent, who knows, it's probably true. But the fact is our people go overseas too. And the thing about it, most of the St. Lucians who are out there are in senior positions. Huh? Um, it's not ordinary waiter or, you know, not at that level. It's at high level, which tells you a lot about the competencies we have in St. Lucia. And the demand for the competencies we have in St. Lucia was very reassuring. So, you know, I met with them and they were telling me, you know, in fact, I, I can tell you the breakfast was cocoa tea and bakes and saltfish and two other guys who were bakers. One is in charge of all pastries, whatnot, and the other guy, um, you know, I think he's from Katri Southeast, actually. Um, he, he, he was one of the main bakers at the hotel. It's a massive hotel. So I was really glad to, to sit to them and hear their stories and to tell them about the vision we have for tourism in St. Lucia, that we want to build a tourism, a tourism industry that is sustainable and inclusive, to reorient it from what it has traditionally been into a new construct that allows more St. Lucians to participate and to own the industry. So I explained to them the vision that we have, and certainly you know, they you know, shared with me their own experiences and their own thoughts. What, and just hearing them saying it from a distance, you know, from carnival to jazz to the bum bum wall to all those things, it was really good at exchange. Friday last week I had a, a similar, well not similar, but I had an engagement to, in London with the diaspora. They too asking questions and again I took the opportunity to sell to them the vision we have for tourism in St. Lucia and how different we want it to be from what it has been. Um, and, and, and I think you know, is to get everybody to understand what we want to do with tourism in, in St. Lucia. Can you mention that vision with us? 
No, you will, 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 will have to give me about <laughs> you'll have to give me about 10, 15 minutes. So, but I, I, you'll get an opportunity because very soon we will be going to the house for the new tourism development bill, and I'll get an opportunity um, to to speak as to that vision for tourism in St. Lucia. And I'm not a guru of tourism. I leave that designation to others. Yeah. My second question: um, the 2.5% levy on sorry, the 2.5% health and security levy. Um, it has been it, on goods and services. Um, how does it affect the um, hotel industry? Because um, I heard that now hoteliers are, uh, are required to pay the 2.5% levy on their advertising, whether they advertise in country or not. Can you give some clarity on that? But whether they were paying um, it or not, well, uh, let, let me say, let, let's start from the general and go to the specific, yeah? L l let's do so. We face a reality where the demands of solutions for better healthcare is insurmountable. I mean, the, the cost of medical care, and if you just spend some time to even just read about the NHS in the UK, how much it costs the government, Medicare in the U US, in Canada, and you look at all countries that provide some measure of, of you know, of accessible health care to the population, it takes a lot of resources. And I remember in the House, two um, budget presentations, I made a specific call for our government to move quickly towards having universal health care. Because as a parliamentary rep, I was feeling the pressure of people coming to me. They want medication because they have, to, they need resources because they have to pay for chemotherapy. They have to do MRIs. They have to do ultrasounds. They can't afford to pay medication for heart problems, for cholesterol and whatnot. And it is you know, depressing that so many of our people cannot afford the health care. Some of us can. We could fly to Miami. And we can, you know, rest and grow our beard and look relaxed and whatnot. And, you know, people can go overseas and, 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 and they have ways and means for them to meet those expenses, whatnot. Um, a lot of solutions don't. They just cannot. They just cannot. And the, the government has to find the, the modality and the mechanism to provide for ordinary people. That somebody doesn't have to die because they can't pay for five rounds of chemo. That would cost, what, three, four thousand dollars? You know, we, we have to think differently. So what do we do? And this is a historical problem that did not start with us. You can ask Senior Minister Stevenson King when he was Minister of Health. You can go as far back as Romanus Lansico, who wanted a new Victoria Hospital. And I don't know how many of you all, we all are probably too young. Maybe Andrew probably can. He started to raise funds for, for Victoria Hospital. And we had to help as little young school boys and things to help raise funds. I mean, Invader Song is famous, Caleb. So, you know, Victoria, crying about the plight of the hospital. But we have evolved as a country. We've built a modern hospital um, funded by the OKEU. But we have to maintain it. And it was calculated that the cost of operating OKEU was an additional 60 plus million dollars. But where do we get it from? We have to get it from somewhere. So what do we do? You come up with a system that doesn't even raise all the money you need. But at least every solution can contribute to better healthcare in the country. And we started already, in some ways, providing medication for those over 80. All their services are free. Um, pregnant, um, you know, well, mothers, pregnant um, ladies and things. So we are, we are starting and gradually we're going to expand the basket of services and expand it and expand it. We need to do it. So resources have to be raised. We also I don't have to tell you about the security situation in the country. It is a concern to every citizen. Our people want citizen safety in this country. It takes resources. The police said to us, look, we, don't even, we, ne we never had a budget in the last five years to pay for even training of police officers. Not even training. And I mean, with vehicles, you know, um, all the, the, the tools of trade that they need. So we need to raise the money. So, okay, a decision was taken to put 2.5% levy on certain goods and services. Certain goods and services. Certain. Already the hospitality sector enjoys a tremendous basket of concessions and incentives. Trust me, they do. A tremendous. The hospitality sector pays a lower VAT than the average St. Lucian. 
But that has to be done because it is felt they need they are the engine of, of, of growth and they fuel the economy. So we have to. Now it's not just hoteliers, but the vendors and the site owners and all the other service providers um, contribute to the economic growth of this country. So I believe that every single St. Lucian should contribute to make sure we have a better healthcare system and to ensure that we have more support to ensure safety in this country, citizen safety. I want to know when I go about and I, I lie in my constituency, I lie in another constituency, that I feel a measure of, of comfort and safety in this country. And I want to know that the police and them get the support for that to happen. And I believe every single St. Lucian should be proud to contribute to know that their grandmother can get her diabetes medicine free of charge and the hypertensive medicine free of charge. And if she has to do an MRI, she doesn't have to pay for it. But that's the St. Lucia we want. But each of us have to contribute to it. How else are we going to finance it if persons do not contribute to it? And then if certain goods and services, because there are certain goods and services you should probably not tax because it would affect you know, the, the more disadvantaged, then let's do it as a people. Let's collectively come together and say, let us, let's get it done. Because it's the better for our country and for our people. Let me tell you, it's not an easy experience when you have people sitting down with you and telling you about, you know, they cannot buy, they're taking their diabetes medicine every other day because they can't afford to pay it. And you know the consequences of doing that. But we should take care of them. And I think, you know, um, you know they, we should ask certain services and goods um, to contribute to that. It's a collective good and it's the betterment of the society. Yes, um, yeah, good, Mr. Minister, yeah, my question a little different. Um, um, you know, lately we've seen that um, with all the events taking place, one of the tourism one shows or the, the big heads in tourism have seen, designated St. Lucia as a festival country. Now we know the um, Genequial is coming up. If there was a, a grand um, opening in a different kind of form, but then the, the exec from FRC said it's going to be bigger than jazz, bigger than carnival. <laughs> I know it's a challenge, but in the whole context, how would um, this whole June Creole, this whole Creole festival fit into the calendar of activities at St. Lucia as a festival country? How big would that be now that you see that? Hey, let me tell you, the last time I commented on that, I got myself in a lot of trouble with my Dominican friends. So, um, you know, the, well, they describe Central as a festival country. I think we are a romance country. We are an adventure country. We are a nature country. We want to be a dive country. And I have no problems with being a festival country. Why? Because they have different times of the year that different people travel for different reasons. Um, you know, during the October, November until March is our big tourism season. A lot of visitors from the cooler countries come down because of the warm fortnight. During the summer is when you have a lot of regional travelers taking place. So from jazz, you know, um, to carnival, and of course going on to Jeune Creole. Um, I've always said from day one when I became minister that the, the vision was for this country to establish a creative economy. For us to have a creative economy. Where our creatives know that almost every month there is something that they can be part of. So I took the example of fashion, for example, why I support we have in fashion shows throughout the year. So we have one, so we have the clothing for independence, then for jazz, and then for carnival, and then for um, emancipation, and then for June Creole. And if you have five fashion shows, it means seamstresses and designers and models and all of them are working five times a year, knowing every time, you know, the, the, the pop shop, pop-up shops and entrepreneurs, you, you create a whole economic, a economy, a series of economic activity around that alone, fashion to support our different festivals. So just think about it. You know, you're a fashion designer. You can design clothes for five peak periods, how much money you can make, how much the same stress is, how much clothes they can sell. You create a, a little economy around the fashion industry. Um, our singers, let me tell you, our, our solo groups have never had it so good in the last two years. I know because I have one in my constituency, they, they, they get calls repeatedly for them to come and perform Wule Tete. I'm very proud uh, of them, and they had a big hit last year. I won't sing it here for you all this morning. You know? And I'm looking forward to what's going to happen this year for Junek Creole. 
So it creates a economic activity for them. You have events, you know, jazz next year we hope to be even bigger than it was last year. I'm not sure we will put more people at Pigeon Point, given how this year was, but if we get the lineup we want, trust me, it's going to be bigger. Carnival this year, in the first 10 days of July, we had 18,000 arrivals in the first 10 days this year. You know, if you just say 60% came for Carnival, think of the numbers that came. It was the biggest we had. And we want June Creole, likewise, to grow and to be even bigger. As to whether this year would have reached that stage, um, I, I don't think so. I still believe there are a lot of elements that have to be put in um, to make sure um, it gets as big as jazz or as big as, um, you know, carnival. Um, a lot of people still go to Dominica for Creole Music Festival. And the last time I said June Creole in St. Lucia can be um, as big as uh, bigger than Dominica, it caused problems. I didn't mean that we were going to compete with Dominica and take away from Dominica, but there is a potential. Because I'll tell you one thing with Carnival. Carnival has a lot of supporters. We also have a lot of detractors. Everybody supports Junior Creole and Creole Heritage Month. You know, it cuts across all spiritual um, beliefs. It cuts across all, you know, visions of morality and you know, ethical behavior, cultural yeah, and then it reinforces cultural tradition. So there are people that will not support carnival because it's back and all. People it's continually dress on the road. They don't have the similar gripes with, with Creole heritage. So Creole heritage will become a massive, massive celebration in St. Lucia. It will take some time to grow. Different aspects of it will also grow. Um, and that, that is the vision. Um, emancipation which was supposed to have been a one-day celebration. It was an entire month last year. This year was another entire month. We have the murals in the city, hoping next year we can do a number of towns and villages as well to supplement what we did. So those things will grow. You will not establish the kind of creative economy I spoke of in one year. You know, it will take a few years, but each year we will get bigger and bigger and bigger, and I think eventually we'll reach where we want to reach. Yes, I have two questions for you. <coughs> yeah, one about CIP and another question that um, for your capacity as Deputy Prime Minister. But uh, for CIP, we're hearing that CIP funds from the opposition, that they do not go into the consolidated fund, they go into the National Economic Fund. Right? And there are talks about this being Im improper and so on. So as... Uh, the minister responsible for CIP, what do you have to say? I don't even know where to get those things from. I mean, somebody must be really dreaming of all kinds of stories. But let me see if I can unravel what this is about. At least let me tell you what, what is happening and what um, the law says. The law says that donations must go to the National Economic Fund. Donat uh, revenue earned from the donation option goes to the National Economic Fund. And that happens. So all the monies that are earned from the donation option goes to the National Economic Fund. The bonds go to the Ministry of Finance. Because these are government saving bonds. And there is legislation that says when you float a bond, blah, 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 the money comes to the Ministry of Finance, which is a consolidated fund. So the bonds go to the Ministry of Finance, um, the Treasury. The donation goes to um, the National Economic Fund. Any savings or excess of revenue over expenditure on operational, and let me explain to you. There are a number of fees that are charged, due diligence fees, administrative fees, application fees, whatnot. At the end of the year, you have a statement of all the fees you earn and how much it took you to run the organization, salaries, rental, whatnot. Any excesses, the Minister of Finance directs how it should be done. That was what happened in the last government. The Minister of Finance then, Alan Chesley, gave instructions that the money has to go to the consolidated fund or to use otherwise. So he used some of the money um, to give for the expo in Dubai. Remember that? So as Minister of Finance, you direct how the money should be spent for whatever purposes, and the law gives you the right as Minister of Finance to do that. And it's no different. There's nothing we're doing now that is different to what they did. Nothing. And I don't know what more I, I, I can say, but I can tell you donations go to the National Economic Fund, bonds go to, um, directly to finance because it's a, a bond that, is, that, that, that has been um, floated and has to be repaid, 
and any excesses in operational revenue, the Minister of Finance says what to do with it. So if he says, pay this bill, do this, send it to the consolidated fund, he decides what to do with it. And that's, that's normal. And that's what we inherited. The, the present Prime Minister has not sought to do anything differently. Uh, just now, this uh, second question. Uh, capacity as Deputy Prime Minister. Okay, now I understand that the DPP has recommended that prosecution be laid against the police officers involved in ORC in two separate incidents, so one which occurred in Masha and one which occurred in Viewfort. That decision was made about two weeks ago. Uh, does this administration have any, have any commitment to making public the impacts report? Or is the administration going to comment on ORC? Well, I'll leave it to the Minister of National Security, who is better briefed on those matters than me, so to comment on. I, I really don't know, and I've been honest with you. Okay, thanks. All right, um, just one question, just an update on the, um, I guess, regional travel situation and airlift coming into the region as well. Um, is there any update in that regard, and what can we see in the foreseeable future? Um, well, certainly the airlift will improve over Q4 um, and Q1 in 2024. Um, we went through, you know, a difficult period during the summer. Um, as Europe opened up, a lot of people went to Europe, a lot of the airlines put their equipment to go to Europe. The FIES opened up and quite a lot of equipment. Um, we've been in discussions, very intense discussions with um, carriers. And, you know, we are going to see a major improvement. Um, I, I, I don't necessarily want to make the announcements now because the airlines will make the, the announcements um, formally. But we are going to see significant increase in airlift capacity out internationally, that is. And we continue to work with airlines to improve it. So you'll hear announcements very shortly from Virgin as to what will be in place next year. I think um, American might have already made their announcement. If not, um, I will ask them when they're going to make their announcement. Delta is also going to increase. JetBlue is also going to increase. And we're expecting very strong um, showing for um, stable arrivals for the season, Q4 into Q1. And the cruise season is about to start in the next two to three weeks. And it's going to be our, our, most, our busiest cruise season ever. So uh, there's going to be, as it relates regional, it continues to be a headache. Um, I've had discussions with Inter-Caribbean. Uh, they just got some more equipment planes, but they're still expecting some more. Um, Liat is still still mid. Um, the Caribbean air, airlines have increased. Again, they're expecting some more equipment planes, but it's getting better. I mean, more and more, um, the airlines are starting to get back equipment. Um, it's taken a long time, um, of course, post-COVID. Um, a lot of the pilots have to be retrained and recertified. Some of the planes that were given up have to be brought back into service, and some of them have orders for new planes that they're still waiting for. So, but it's getting better. I can tell you from one year ago, uh, it's getting um, better, and we hopefully sometime next year will return to a state of normalcy. Um, a lot will depend on the future of Liat. St. Lucia has stated its clear position that we support a public sector solution to connectivity in the region. Um, they can, we also will support private sector interventions, but we believe to counter the, not counter, but to supplement the private sector, there must be a public sector solution. Because we've learned um, in the past that when the private sector is challenged by economic difficulties and pull away, we have to have something to carry us through. And if we had a public sector solution in place, we would not be suffering as we are. And it's of importance to St. Lucia because regional arrivals was our second largest source. So it was the US, regional, UK, Canada. And with the, U the regional declining so significantly, it has affected our regional numbers because St. Lucia was a very attractive regional destination. So we have a very vested interest in a regional solution. Yes. <clears throat> in your capacity as Deputy Prime Minister, um, are you aware that the Taiwanese government has issued a statement about that um, OIDC, OECC affair um, to clarify on the loans. Now, this is not the first time that 
uh, Labour Party government has called the integrity of the Taiwanese government into question. There was the Tom Chu affair and the recalling of Tom Chu as, as the uh, ambassador for St. Lucia. And now we have another thing. Are you, or is the SLP government in any way worried that these um, issues would impact on the bilateral relationship between Taiwan and St. Lucia? Well, I, I, I don't think the government and people of Taiwan should be worried about this. Um, the, the government and people of Taiwan are our friends, um, friends of St. Lucia. We have a strong relationship. We have strong bilateral um, arrangements in place. And there is no issue with this or any questioning of this. And you made mention of the Tom Shu situation. I think then what was required was to call the irregular practices that were, that were taking place. In fact, our view was reinforced by Janine Compton, who was then a representative in the ruling government, who herself said that the practices were unusual. And she had decided then that the money they was giving her as parliamentary rep, she put it in the treasury and draw down on it from the treasury. The others decided that they would accept money paid directly to them, which we said was unusual and should not be done. It had nothing to do with the government and people. It was the practice that was being put in place by the local representative and the government then. In this case, it's an issue of ex ex expressing the arrangement that was in place with a private company, with a company out of Taiwan. That has nothing to do with the government of Taiwan or the, um, the people of Taiwan. I mean, we, we are bilateral partners and we like family. It has nothing to do with that. It's the same way we can criticize TUAC and DSH. We were not attacking um, you know, those individuals. If we have problems with Cabot, which we did, we were not attacking the Canadian government and the people of Canada. Why should anybody extend it to mean in this case we are attacking the government of Taiwan and the people? No. When we criticized Cabot, did anybody say we were criticizing the Canadian government? When we criticize other developers who don't practice you know, um, best practices in St. Lucia, um, is that an attack on the government? No, it's not. I mean, these bilateral relationships um, exist in a different sphere altogether. But, but go ahead. Mr. Minister, um, OIDC is, is a subsidiary. Yeah. OIDC mm. is a subsidiary of the Taiwanese government, and OECC was contracted by them to to um, uh, play on according to the Minister of Foreign Affairs in Taiwan. The loan was fully transparent and they were the ones who chose to go that way. So, Who chose to go that way? The Taiwanese government. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, are you, are you in any way worried? You're not I am not worried, and, and, and I, I don't see why anybody should be worried. If something happened which requires clarification, and that was an unusual practice, it was a a practice which is not in keeping with our understanding of the Finance Act, then we say so. And then, you know, let's sit down as friends and say, but look, why did this happen? In fact, I mean, if anything, they, they probably should give us all the information they have and help us understand what happened. But I mean, we, we are friends and, and we will be friends because it's the nature of the relationship we have with them. We have a, a long record of working with the Taiwanese and you know, it doesn't mean that we will not express, you know, concern if we see something, if any government for that matter, any government for that matter. So I'm not worried about this, you know. In, in international diplomacy and relations, um, you, there are ways and means of handling those issues. So.